I'm Alison Smith and I manage the Mersey Tunnel Tours. The tour is about two hours long and involves touring the ventilation station, seeing all the big fan chambers, the old control centre and then we also take you down in to see the traffic in the tunnel and we go underneath to see the refuge system as well so a few stairs to do as well over your two hours. Okay so welcome to George's Dock Building. Um, I'm Alison, your other tour guide today is going to be Billy. And what we do today is we actually take you on a tour of the ventilation station and then down to the tunnel itself. So we go to the top of the building and take you to our old control room, down through the fan chambers and we end up going down into the tunnel to, to see the safety refuge system. So this is our tunnel. It's 46 foot diameter. You've got a road deck across the middle and underneath there it's called Central Avenue and it's where we were going to run the tram system. So we'll explain a little bit about that when we get down to there. So it's four lanes in one, they don't build tunnels like this anymore. It's quite an unusual tunnel. One of the largest bores of tunnel actually anywhere in the world. And what they did, they dropped shaft down on the Liverpool side, 200 feet, and shaft down on the Birkenhead side, and teams of men set off with the aim of meeting in the middle. It's all hand dug this tunnel, it took nine years with pickaxes, small explosives. And uh, when they met in the middle, it was 1928, and uh, they were less than an inch out, so it's very accurate work. Then had to hollow it all out to get your main tube, and that's it. They hollow out the top half first before doing the bottom half, and it's fitted with cast iron plates, silver lead, and covered in concrete. We'll explain a little bit more about that as we go around to you, okay? This is the original control room from 1934. Responsibility of the engineers in here is pumps, ventilation and power supplies. We have seven pumping stations underneath the Mersey and we're constantly pumping out water out the tunnel. But if you're worried about what kind of water it is, it's not the river, alright? It's actually groundwater because we seep upwards, we don't leak downwards. Um, the river is actually about 100 feet above us as we go through the tunnel and the groundwater it's just risen over the years, so you've got more pressure on the joint. So we have seven pumps, uh, pump about 200 gallons a minute when they go off. There was also a telephone switchboard here, it's one of the original control of engineers. And then this area here says Liverpool supply, Birkenhead supply, that's about electric coming in. We take 50% from Wirral, 50% from Liverpool, so you would have switched the, the supplies with these buttons here. The tunnel is a full circle uh, with a road deck across the middle. There's a large area under the road called Central Avenue and the plan was to run trams down there. Okay, so where we are now, we're in our exhaust fan chamber. So the purpose of this room is to get the dirty car fumes out of the tunnel. So how do we do that? Behind you there, in the corner, you may be able to hear the noise of the traffic coming up. There's an 80 foot shaft that drops down, snakes over and attaches itself to the roof of the tunnel. These ventilation stations aren't built directly with the tunnel, they're built to the side. Okay, so the foul air now is going through black rectangular holes in the roof space of the tunnel, coming across a tube, up this 80 foot shaft, the foul air now is working its way past us and into the fan system behind us. Now you may be wondering why that fan isn't on at the moment. Okay, these fans now and only really on where we've got standing traffic in the tunnel. Okay, so the fresh air fans do it for us. Yeah, right. What we're going to do in a moment is we've got to get the fans put on for you. Okay, the size of the fans, they're 28 foot in diameter, they weigh 25 tons in weight, and you've got the capability to pull or push half a million cubic feet of air in one minute. Okay, just to simplify that, six Olympic sized swimming pools in one minute, this fan could draw out. Okay, when we get the fan on, we're just going to have it on a half speed, at full speed it can do roughly about 70 revs per minute. not gone anywhere they're that big that the stuff has to come to them we can't take them out of the building so we have trains and pulleys and we either bring equipment to this room or we take it to the room upstairs okay where you've just come down from same size of fans in here 
this bit here. This is David Brown, that's the gearbox, as in DBS, Aston Martin. Okay. Good old gearboxes on these. And uh, we don't have the fresh air fans on all day these days because the car engines are much cleaner. We have to get them switched on and off as we need to use them, so it may or may not be on. Uh, this is a fresh air chamber, a bit cleaner, a bit brighter, a little bit colder. Um, but what you can't see where we are stood here is where any fresh air is coming from, can you? So what we have to do, walk around the other side. See the, the top of the building, where the daylight's coming in. So the very top of the building is our chimney, the tall thin bits is the chimney. And then the next section down, shoulder level, is where our air comes in from. So when the fan's working, it will be turning and it pulls the air in down past you, goes down about 120 feet and it comes out underneath the roadway. So you've got the road deck across the middle, it's got these air inverts either side. The air is pushed along there, comes up through a series of holes. So it doesn't sound very effective, but believe me, if you're down there and the fan's on full speed, it's about 36 miles an hour. So it's very windy when you get down to that point. Fans are on at the minute, obviously the air quality in the tunnel is good enough that it's not needed to be on. So where we are now, we're underneath Brunswick Street. So we're in this first archway here of a series of archways going that way towards the River Mersey. Okay? So what happens? George's dock, old rectangular dock, used to run along here under the overhead railway, down Man Island, past the Pyramid Ferry Terminal, and back up past the Royal Harbour Buildings. Come into disuse in the mid 1800s. And the reason for that was the boats that were coming into this, this dock were getting too big. Liverpool as a port was growing, so they needed more docks. So they decided to shut this dock down because of where it was situated, right in the centre of Liverpool, and they started building bigger docks north and south. But they had a problem, because the only crossing at the time, and this was before the railway tunnel come along in 1886, was on the Mersey Ferry. So people would come across on the ferry, get off at the pier head, and then they'd have to walk all the way around this rectangular dock and into the centre of Liverpool to do the day's business. So what they've done, dried the dock out and put two bridges across, Brunswick Street and Water Street, just to make it more accessible for people when they got off the ferry to come right into the centre of Liverpool. This photograph was taken in 1907 on the completion of the Port of Liverpool building. The Royal Liver Buildings building has come along next, 1911. Cunard Buildings in the middle, 1916. And George's Dock Building, 1934. This structure here, the old overhead railway, locally known as the Dockers Umbrella. Just over seven miles long, ran from the Dingle up to Seaforth and Litherland. It had actually three world firsts with that. It was the first elevated electric railway in the world. It was the first elevated railway to have escalators, but they didn't last long because a lot of the ladies in the day used to wear long dresses, used to get caught. And also it had the, the first uh, automated electric signaling system. And what I mean by that, if a train driver went through a red signal, it had an automatic system in place to stop the train. So where we are now, we're actually on reclaimed land and when they built these bridges they were worried because they knew the river Mersey would come and try and find its natural banks which is the other side of the six lane strand road St Nick's Church so what they've done they put these holes in the walls okay, and they're called culverts okay, and that's to allow the river to come through so it didn't affect the bridge structure okay because it's salt in here see all the little white bits that's actually salt because this was in the river so it still leaches salt out of its joints and then the, the orange bit I assume is because it's coming through something a bit rusty as well as it drips through. Wow. That wall at the back is George's dock wall built in 1771. Okay. The wooden post is part of the jetty where the sailing ship's tied up. That staircase we've just walked down was one of the original shafts that was dug down by the men to come through this access tube and start the daily dig outside on the tunnel. At the height of construction of this tunnel, 1,700 men started on both sides, dug by hand, pickaxe, small explosives and a theodolite. When they broke through, they were only an inch out. And the joke is, if they would have been a lot further out, we would have had two tunnels a lot quicker than what we ended up getting. 
<laughs> what we're going to do now, we're going to take you outside onto the road deck and we're going to point a few things out to you. See the black rectangular holes? That's where the TC car feeds now are being forced up. The fresh air is underneath the road deck and we get it out. See that gap all the way through? The gaps are in the exhaust level. So the fresh air is coming out and it's pushing the foul air out. The flat section of the roof is basically where the ventilation station attaches itself to the top. Uh, okay. Very difficult to see when you drive through. And that was like two minutes by the In 1999, we had a terrible uh, disaster, the Mont Blanc disaster, terrible tunnel fire. Lorry went on fire in this tunnel. People died in the vehicles, but also people died who made it to the safety refuges. The problem with the safety refuges in the Mont Blanc, a little bit similar to this, they're on road deck level, but in the Mont Blanc, there was only one way in and one way out. Also, all the communication systems burnt out, so all the cabling was above road deck level. But the people who made it to the safety refuges couldn't be communicated with. I don't know whether you're aware that fire burned for over two days. Right. So after that, all tunnels in Europe had to go through safety reviews. Because we've got that big space down below, that's where our safety refuges are housed. We could still use this as an escape passage. But under the river section of the tunnel, the straight section of the tunnel, we needed to put, put safety refuges in. So evacuate people down underneath the road deck in a safe space. We've got seven safety refuges. We're going to go into refuge G shortly. Okay, and they're all interlinked. They were put in now about 15 years ago and they cost us a staggering amount of money, nine million pounds to put in. We're in Central Avenue now and this is where you've got to picture two double-decker trams running. Hold plan for this. Would have been two double decker trams running between Birkenhead and Liverpool. They run parallel or would it yeah. just be parallel uh, to each other, yeah. Okay. Um, now, as I said, the idea was dropped, and so they had the build underway. And so it's this size all the way under the river section, but as it comes out into the city streets here in Birkenhead, it does narrow down. So it's not this size right the way out. Obviously, you have to have uh, some way of getting out at the other end. Um, although we didn't run the trams through here, it did get used for various things. This box-like structure here is one of the main electric cables. You know, quite often people would lay things on a riverbed, but we have this advantage that we can run cabling down here. So 6,600 volts uh, in there, in case in there. So it's one of your national grid cables. The other thing we could do down here was um, all these electric cables, communication cables. People like BT and Virgin, they pay to have their cabling down here again rather than on the riverbed. It's safe, it's dry, they can come down here to access it to work. And then the other cables are our own network cables and the hard wiring across the estate all the way around all the different plant stations. So, safety refuge G. Okay, nine million pounds we spent on these uh, seven refuges. So what did we spend the money on, right? Most of the money was spent on our communication system, which is that box in the corner, and that's our communication to the tunnels police on the first floor of George's Dock building. So what would happen in an emergency? As soon as you activate one of these doors, an alarm goes off in their room and they would come on the screen and come and talk to you, tell you what's happening, how long you're likely to be down here. Uh, there's one of these boxes in each of the seven safety refuges, so all the confusion on the road deck up above you may have run into a different safety refuge from your partner or family member. So what they do is go on each of the safety refuges just to make sure everyone was safe and if anyone needed first aid. Because as you can see, there's no first aid equipment down here. The tunnels police are not only trained in first aid, they're also trained in firefighting. So in the backs of every vehicle, they've got first aid equipment and they've also got breathing apparatus to try and put a fire out. I thought it was really interesting and um, there was a lot of information about how the tunnel was constructed there was a lot of information regarding um, like how the tunnel is ventilated and overall thought it was a really good tour, it was really informative and actually getting out onto the tunnel itself and seeing all the traffic coming along and seeing how close the tunnel, the internal tunnel was to the outside I mean being able to actually see parts of the bridge, the ventilation and all the 
mechan um, mechanisms that they've got upstairs is phenomenal. In terms of its relevance to my course, it's, it's very related because it's got a lot, all, all the buildings and stuff and all the, the materials that, were, that we were subject to and we saw, there's a lot of degradation and stuff and this is specific stuff that I'll be interested in on my course.